Welcome to Reboot the World, Campus Party's first ever digital edition. We're so excited to have Josh Siegel from Michigan State University present Deep Technology, Impossible Yesterday, Challenging Today, and Invisible Tomorrow. So before we begin, I want to invite all of our campuseros who are watching to add your questions in the live chat so we can monitor those and have a great Q&A here at the end. So without further ado, take it away, Josh. Great. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, my name is Josh Siegel. I'm an assistant professor at Michigan State University. Uh, and today I'll be talking to you about deep technology. Uh, I actually run the deep technology lab at Michigan State University. And so it's a topic very near and dear to my heart, but not a lot of people know what it is. So over the next roughly 45 minutes, uh, my goal is to introduce you to what deep technology is how we can think about it and how you can become more involved in becoming a practitioner in deep technology. Um, the slides will move quickly. This will be archived on YouTube, so no need to worry about that. You'll be able to go back to the material for ready reference. Uh, and as was mentioned, I do encourage interaction and questions. So please, uh, if you have anything pressing that you'd like answered, do make sure to ask those questions. What I'll take you through over the next couple of minutes, like I said, is defining deep technology, looking at why we can build deep technology today, a few representative examples of deep tech, and then how you can become practitioners. So this kind of sets the stage for what we'll be going through in terms of uh, a topic list. So that you know a little bit more about who I am, the perspective that I bring to this is that of a researcher and an academic. Uh, so I work at Michigan State University in the Computer Science and Engineering Department. I research ubiquitous connectivity, so making sure that anything, anywhere is connected to the internet safely, securely, and efficiently. I work on pervasive sensing, so taking what we call data exhaust from your mobile devices and turning it into something meaningful and actionable. Um, in this case, a lot of the work that I do is building uh, vibroacoustic sensors for cars. So. If you've used Shazam on your phone and that tells you the song that's playing on the radio, I do something very similar where I can listen to your car or feel your car and tell you what's going wrong with it or what maintenance needs you may have. Um, I also work with self-driving vehicles there. So you'll see a lot of that come through in this presentation where we look about connectivity as a main theme or self-driving cars or data analytics. Uh, I am the lead instructor of the IoT and deep tech boot camps at MIT. Uh, those programs likely will be offered later in 2020 or very early 2021, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, and I was a research scientist at MIT before coming to MSU. But I also have a practical perspective that I bring to deep technology. It's not just what do we do in the laboratory, it's what do we do that we can commercialize and turn into a product and sell to people and to help people with. Um, so I've started a number of companies before coming to MSU building inertial navigation units for soldiers. So using uh, non-satellite GPS for indoor localization, uh, I built a connected car platform and I built a company based on my vehicle diagnostic work. So that's the background that I bring to this, those life experiences of entrepreneurship and research and corporate engagement. Um, but what is, what is this, right? What are we talking about today? We're talking about this concept of deep technology. And you may have heard the term before. You may have been talking to investors about it. You may have seen presentations about it. Um, the reality is it's kind of like the internet of things, right? Everyone has their own definition for it. And because we're using the same word to mean different things, it kind of muddles the term a little bit. It dilutes its meaning. And so over the next couple of minutes, I'd like to take you through what I believe to be the best definition of deep technology. So we know that the world is changing. We know 2020 is unlike 2019, which is unlike 2018. We know there are big problems in the world today and big opportunities. They're meaningful, they're significant in scale. And in order to find an effective solution to any of those problems, or in order to meet those opportunities in the best possible way, we need to use new technologies. We need to use new capabilities that weren't available to us yesterday. We have new tools at our disposal. We have new modes of thinking, and we can apply those to make the world a better place. Right? But it's not about working within a silo. If you go back 20 years and you talk to someone in engineering, you might ask them what they work on, and they say, oh, I'm mechanical, or I'm electrical, or, oh, I do software development. The world doesn't work like that anymore. 
We need to work across silos. We need to work across the disciplines in order to combine these new technologies, these new capabilities, these new affordances to build something that's truly impactful, right? So deep technology is anything that addresses problems that are at the intersection of meaningful, significant, and barely feasible. And that's the opportunity that we go after with deep technology and in my research group at MSU. And if you go after problems like this, then you are a deep tech practitioner already. So deep technology obviously has technology in the name. So we build upon this idea of technical discovery. We also build upon this idea of convergent innovation, that idea that we don't work within a silo. We do uh, draw across disciplines to be faithful to a problem rather than a discipline in order to solve it in the best possible way. Right? So thinking about solving a, a new problem using old technology, not necessarily deep tech, or thinking about solving an old problem with a new technology is not necessarily deep tech, but solving a new problem with a new technology or new combination of technologies, that is deep technology. So some of you may be familiar with the Gartner hype cycle. If you're not, I highly recommend that you take a look at it. Um, it basically says that technology starts out kind of rough. It's hard to build. Not a lot of people have it. Not a lot of people want it. Not a lot of people know that they want it. And so you start out here where you have no expectation, right? And you're, you're at T equals zero on your time axis. What happens is people begin to explore technology and they find out, hey, it can do a lot of great things if we can build it the right way. And so that's the technology trigger. It's saying, we know that we have this new capability and we know that we can apply it in some unique way. Right? And then we get to this point where we get to the peak of inflated expectation. We were there probably two years ago, maybe three years ago with the internet of things where we try and apply that technology to solving every problem, even if it's a problem for which that technology is not the best solution. So it's all hyped up, people try and build it, they realize it's hard, and they get into this trough of disillusionment because it doesn't solve the right problem. Or if it does solve the problem, it's way too complicated. Then people figure out how to build it, that's the slope of enlightenment, and we get to this plateau of productivity, right? and that's where that technology is diffused throughout society. No longer do you need to be a technical expert to install this or to use it or to understand it. You flip the switch and it just works. So if you think about deep technology along the lines of this hype cycle, which is used very commonly by investors and by market research companies, deep technology is everything from the technology trigger until the slope of enlightenment. So you find a new idea, you think about what it's possible to do with this concept, you realize it's hard, and then you start to make it easy. But deep technology does diffuse. We talked about that as we get to this plateau of productivity. So deep tech eventually becomes high tech, and high tech becomes technology. The way in which this happens is through something called the Kano model, the Kano model of diffusion or the Kano model of innovation. And so the Kano model says that technology that at one point in time is a delighter over time becomes a basic need. And so the best example I can give of this is air conditioning. So what happens is you invent a technology, people become thrilled with it, it becomes diffused, people adopt it, and then it becomes something that must be included for your product or your service to be successful. And so the whole point of deep technology is that we aim to take technology from delighter to basic need. We want to take something that was impossible yesterday and make it boring today. So the definition that I give for deep technology and the definition that I hope that you will adopt in talking about it is that deep technology is a problem solving technology that was impossible yesterday, is hard to build today, and tomorrow has the potential to become so pervasive that it's invisible and so important that we can't live without it. So deep technology obviously changes over time. At one point, air conditioning was deep technology. At one point, color television was deep technology. At one point, the remote control was deep technology. If you're looking at this slide deck uh, a week from now or a month from now or a year from now, 
The topics that are deep technology that I'm talking about today will hopefully no longer be deep tech, and this entire list will be replaced. But as of this presentation right now, in July of 2020, the deep tech that I focus on in my group, because I believe it's impactful, because I believe it is something that we can uh, uh, change the world with, because we can solve big problems, the technology that is fun for us to research, but also is not trivial, it is a hard problem, we, we tend to look at these technologies on the slide. We look at, like I said, pervasive sensing. So using a mobile phone to tell you when your car is gonna break down or universal diagnostics, using that phone in someone's pocket to tell whether they have early onset Parkinson's or to determine that a belt in a washing machine is slipping. We look at mobility, reliability, safety, and efficiency. Transportation, huge user of energy, huge safety issue for some people, depending on where they are in the world. If we can make it safer, if we can make it more efficient using deep tech, we can have huge impact with a very transformative technology. Secure and efficient connectivity. I think the latest estimate right now is that we've got about 25 billion connected devices. That's with a B. So we've got more devices than people, about three to one that are on the internet. Um, so we need those devices to be resource efficient in terms of bandwidth, in terms of battery use, and we need them to be secure so that the information that we generate can't be used in bad ways. Uh, connected and automated vehicles we look at, so self-driving cars or cars that even have collision avoidance technologies, moral, ethical, and explainable AI, so artificial intelligence that we can point to and say that's why it made that decision. Oh, and yes, that AI is unbiased and uh, can help large groups of people. Right? Digital transformation for companies, cybersecurity, blockchain, AR, VR, any sort of augmented or assisted or mixed reality has the potential to be very transformative. And then human-centric computing. If you build a wonderful system, but people can't work with it, or it doesn't interoperate with people, then that system is no good. So July 2020, that's my take on deep tech. Um, obviously, there are things like biotech as well. Uh, there are different areas worthy of exploration depending on your skill set. But deep technology really is just this technology that a year ago people would laugh at you for trying to build. And right now, you don't have readily available tools to implement, but tomorrow, if done right, everyone's going to use. So deep tech is today's cutting edge and tomorrow's boring. And if my group does its job well, or if you do your job well as a deep tech practitioner, right, we'll make headlines in newspapers today and tomorrow people will forget us. And that's kind of what we aspire to do. So thinking about deep technology in that context of, we take different technologies, we combine them in new and unique ways to solve real problems, what makes deep tech possible? So deep technology benefits from pervasive sensing. Um, if you look at your cell phone today, that cell phone has about 50 sensors in it. And that was made possible by economies of scale and commoditization of the hardware within your phone. Uh, if you go back 20 or 30 years, accelerometers were used in research labs and cars in order to set off airbags. They were very expensive. They were very accurate. But it turns out you don't always need that level of accuracy. And so Nintendo came along with a Nintendo Wii, and they made sensing feasible for everyone to use. They said, we don't need super accurate data. What we do need is tens of millions of sensors. And so they built the Nintendo Wii, and suddenly gyroscopes, accelerometers, uh, magnetic field sensors, all of these devices that were at one point in time cost prohibitive suddenly had been had suddenly had become commoditized to the point where they could be used in any device and basically made disposable from a cost perspective. And so we went from airbags diffusing down from maybe 20 or $30 for a sensor to the Wii, two to $3 for a sensor to a cell phone where suddenly these sensors might be on the order of 10 to 15 cents. So pervasive sensing is a key enabler of deep technology. And if you wanna go out today and go on Amazon or AliExpress or Adafruit or SparkFun or any, any major vendor that sells electronic components, you can buy these sensors. You can get 50 sensors tomorrow in a development kit for about $40. So things that were prohibitive now are trivial to access and they're trivial to interface with.
Networking and connectivity are hugely important. Again, another theme that we look at in our research laboratory. So you've probably heard about 5G. 5G has the potential to really transform the world. High bandwidth, low latency. Um, there are challenges, for example, looking at range of the radio. But if you need to have an automated vehicle or stream 4K, and you need it to be wireless, 5G will be the way to go when it's rolled out in full. There are low power wide area networks, things that can have a 20 to 30 year battery life. Uh, no, I didn't misspeak. It could be a 30 year battery life in your system. And so that opens up this whole possibility of building a connected device, uh, device that maybe you throw out of an airplane or you drop it while you're rock climbing somewhere out in the wilderness and you can get data about avalanches or mudslides and get that 30 kilometers away. Um, and then we also have ubiquitous and point-to-point -point connectivity like Bluetooth low energy. So device to device, tile trackers, things like that. The ability to share small amounts of data, but not use energy and to share fairly, uh, fairly low latency information. Right? So connectivity and advanced networking is another enabler of deep technology. So we have data generated in these sensors. We have data moving around on these networks. What we need to be able to do is process it next. And that's where we get into efficient and parallel computing. And so new CPU architectures, eight core cell phones, uh, things like Elastic Cloud, if you have Amazon Web Services or Azure or Google Cloud, right? you can basically buy as much compute as you want and not have to ever deal with socketing a processor on a motherboard. And you don't need to own it. You can license it. You can rent it hour by hour or minute by minute. And things like GPUs that might have tens of thousands of cores on them. Um, these are really the enablers for the analytics and web service side of things. So how do we take that information, process it, do something meaningful with it, and then spit it back to the user? And it's not just these big platforms where you can rent compute by the hour. You can buy microcontrollers. You can buy an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. Um, it's incredible to me, but you can get a quad core microcomputer with eight gigabytes of RAM for under $70 today that runs full Linux or a microcontroller, depending on where you buy these, you can get Arduino compatible boards, not the official brand name, but compatible boards for $2. So that's how we can do processing now if we're trying to build deep technology. If we need to share that data at larger scales, we need to be able to put things online. That's where scalable web APIs and web platforms come in. APIs, standardized programming interfaces to allow for data use and interchange. Um, and so this really is a new opportunity because we've got that data, we've got it processed, it's online now, and now we can serve it to other devices. So APIs really are integral for deep technology. Digital twins are a big trend that enables deep tech. Um, the idea of a digital twin is that we have a digital duplicate of a physical system in a remote computer or in the cloud. Uh, more used in industry than in consumer applications, but tons of software out there for it today. And if you can mirror a complete system in a remote computing environment, you can do really amazing things with it. Um, like understand when it's going to fail, understand how it's being used. So great opportunities here that are just beginning to be explored right now. If we've got all of these electronic devices and we're putting them on the internet, we need power, we need energy. And so we need advances in that area to make this feasible as well. And so lithium ion batteries, ultra capacitors, super capacitors, uh, solar panels, even whether it's cheap wireless charging or electricity or some longer range protocol. These are all emergent capabilities that allow us to put more devices online, sharing more data for longer. And then finally, in this loop of sense, connect, infer, and act or actuate, we have actions that allow us to feed back in the physical world or the digital world. So we've got wearable devices, we've got um, tack doors, they're pretty cool. If your phone taps with notification, that is an actuator. The screen that feeds information back to you, AR, VR, mixed reality, all of that is an actuator that closes the loop, 
that lets you get that information from your sensor that's been processed that's been put on a platform and then do something with it, whether it's controlling the environment directly or informing a human. But in these actuators, just like sensors, they're newly ubiquitous. Screens that are in everything, motors and servos and relays are in everything. Uh, RGB LEDs, for better or worse, are in everything. One of the things that is kind of latent in that description of deep tech, where we look at sense, connect, infer, and act, is this idea <coughs> of inference. And so deep and machine learning support deep technology. So artificial intelligence systems, things like transfer learning, learning in a digital environment, moving it to reality, reinforcement learning, using mathematical functions for computers to learn behaviors that are extremely complicated through exploration and exploitation. Um, adversarial networks, so training computers to play games against other computers so that we can build photorealistic images or generate deep fakes or change the weather in a photograph. These are capabilities that kind of operate in the background here that make deep technology really impactful. And AI development itself is newly partially automated. It means if you've got enough data and you know that your data is uh, adequate, you know, it's sufficient variety, sufficient volume, unbiased data, which is a huge problem because we typically put our own biases into data sets. If we can make sure that we have enough truly representative data computers can generate AI systems for us. And so that's a new capability enabling deep technology as well. So that is sort of what's behind the scenes with deep technology. Um, what does deep tech look like today? And not just in my lab. So we'll go over a couple different representative technologies now. And we'll look at IoT, Industry 4.0, artificial intelligence, robotic automation, like self-driving cars. VR and AR, uh, cybersecurity and blockchain. And so if you look at this slide alone and you look at this on Google Trends, you know it, it looks like buzzwords and jargon, but the reality is this is how the world operates now. These are the things that people need to know, they need to follow. And if you're trying to create a company or if you're trying to go work at a very innovative leading edge company, these are the capabilities you need to, if not know how to build, you need to be aware of. So the IoT, um, the IoT, let's see, it looks like we're getting some weird artifacts on the graphics there. Hopefully that's not coming through for you. Um, but the IoT is the internet of things, right? It's taking all of these devices and people who are newly on the internet and letting them share data at large scale. Okay, so it is large geographic scale, it is large numeric scale in terms of number of devices, and it's the next evolution of the internet. So we used to have human to human interactions, then we got the World Wide Web, then we got web stores, then social media. And now where we are right now with IoT really is saying we are putting devices on the internet and we are allowing those devices to talk to other devices because as you'll see in a minute, devices have been on the internet for a long time. It's just, they were put on the internet for particular purposes and now we're building platforms. So just like with deep tech, everyone defines IoT a little bit differently here. Um, and so Kevin Ashton is the guy who's typically given credit for coming up with the name, the internet of things. Um, he was working at the auto ID labs uh, at MIT in 1998 or 1999. He was there visiting while he was doing research for Procter and Gamble. Um, and he came up with the term IOT and said it's computers sensing things for themselves. So we measure things, we process them, and they kind of act on it in their own little bubble. Right? We've got Ravi Papu, who at a boot camp that I led, uh, gave this definition, the internet of things makes the physical world amenable to computation. Ravi Papu works at InQtel, uh, which is like the venture branch of uh, various intelligence agencies. And so they know a thing or two about computers. Former PhD advisor Sanjay Sarma said IoT is a set of technology principles, architectures, and concepts with which you can do magic. Uh, it's a way to question why switches need wires to bulbs. And so there's that very flowery, very elegant prose saying IoT lets us do things that we've always done 
in a new and perhaps better way. But then we've got Dom Guinard, who Sanjay supervised this PhD. Uh, Dom is now, I believe, CEO of a company called Everything that works in IoT. Dom says the IoT is a science primarily focusing on creating the most complex ways of turning lights on. And so you see these definitions all vary. There are some elements that are very similar across them, but look at these last two and see the dichotomy there and then realize everyone on this slide is right. It is this ethereal term trying to describe something that is changing and evolving and adapting and depending on what you need it to do, IoT, your IoT may be different from my IoT. But again, if we're not using the same vocabulary, it's kind of hard to talk about the same thing. And so I'd like to redefine the Internet of Things here. And I had said devices were long on the Internet, long before IoT. Um, and so we used to have M to M connectivity. That was one device talking to another device. And we could get online, you know, any time, any place and with anything. These things were really purpose built. It was device to device or device to device for one application, maybe two applications. Now devices form larger and larger networks and those networks support extensible development platforms. So it's those APIs we talked about, the ability to share data. And if networks continue to grow, one day IoT is going to look a little bit like this, everything talking to everything else. So scale and four capabilities differentiate IoT from this historic element of machine to machine connectivity. We've got sensing, connectivity, inference, and actuation. How do we generate data? How do we move it where it's useful? How do we turn machine insight? And then how do we act upon that? Right? And then we have the same parallel advances that are behind some of what's going on with deep technology, low cost sensing, scalable processing, pervasive connectivity. As a result of those advances, 90% of data in human history were generated in the last two years. And so we say IoT is devices and services that connect to one another intelligently and that sense, infer, and act. IoT's capabilities and applications comprise a full stack. You've got applications, you've got enablers, and then you've got constituent technologies and you've got an incredible amount of value behind it. By some estimates, 20 to potentially $30 trillion added to GDP by 2035. So IoT does some pretty cool things, and I'm gonna fly through a couple examples here just because I'm cognizant we have a limited time to talk about basically the future of all technology. Um, and so, like I said, these slides will be available on YouTube, and I do apologize for, for going quickly. We're trying to compress a lot of information here. But if you think about car rentals, it used to be that you'd have to go to the airport and you'd have to wait in line and you'd have to have someone scan your driver's license and then look up in the database where a car is parked and find the key. Took forever. Zipcar is an IoT company. They put their keys and your license on the internet. Suddenly they put a car online. They don't need to manage an airport parking lot. They don't necessarily need to look up where the car is. You don't need to wait in line to get the key because the key's inside the car and they unlock it on the internet. Right? They know your credentials, they unlock the door, you get in, you drive away. Toll booths, very manual. Now easy pass, that's an IoT technology that eliminates the human bottleneck. If you have an equipment heavy business like a gym where maybe you're underutilized or if you have one trainer and they can only meet with people one-to-one -one so many hours per day, you could become a company like Peloton, where you put your personal trainer in thousands of homes and you get that same engagement. And even better than that, you don't have to buy the bikes that are gonna sit there empty all day. People buy the bike on their own. And then uh, if they have the bike in their house, you don't need that capital cost. Durable goods like cars adapt over time now. And so a car that you bought at one point in time never used to change. But now we've got Tesla, the first car that will enable new and significant features with over-the-air updates. And finally, back to Sanjay and Dom Guinard's uh, assertion that IoT helps move light bulbs without moving wires, right? We can do that now. So we don't need to call facilities and get a quote and have them drill a new hole in a wall. We can use Philips Hue and we can move lights around our house. So that's IoT. 
Industry 4.0 is enabled by IoT. The idea here is that we are moving back towards individualized production. It used to be that people would buy bespoke goods and then we started the industrial revolution. We had interchangeable parts. The whole benefit of interchangeable parts was that it was the same part made anywhere and so that you could buy a gun stock, right? And you could buy a trigger at another place and know that they would work together. Over time, there were multiple revolutions in industry, quality improved, electronics were introduced. Now we're getting to the point where we can use things like additive manufacturing or 3D printing, and we can do high volume production. We can still have interchangeable parts, but we can do mass customization. And the way we do that is by having factories that share data and offer safe and secure remote control. Right. Um, we've got semantic web that allows machines to interact with each other in an automated fashion. We've got better analytics that let us build products that people actually want. AI pairs with IoT, pairs with the industrial internet of things. AI, the whole point of this is to distill information to insight so that people and processes can be informed. And a data scientist uses AI to build tools or to build solutions by finding the signal within noise. It's like tuning an old timey radio. There are different types of AI. Um, there's machine learning, which is typically better if you know the rules of the game you're playing. And then there's a deep learning where if you don't know the rules or if you can't quantify it, um, that might be what you end up using, right? So if you're doing self-driving, deep learning, if you're doing chess, then do, do machine learning. The rules. So deep technology is like technology today. It's one of the big trends that we see emerging. Um, it can be general purpose or it can be specialized. Self-driving, that tends to be more of uh, a specialized kind of thing. If you're trying to build a robot that will get into a car, drive itself, and then walk around your house, that's general purpose. Deep learning is one of the things that most of my students end up asking me about at some point or another. And so I'll give a quick digression into how it works. Um, deep learning basically looks at known labeled data and says, here's a picture of a cat and here's a picture of a dog and it guesses different things and then feeds back into the system whether its guess was correct so that it can learn what we call latent rules, rules that are not explicit that it over time through exploration learns. And so if you look at these two images, you might from the first image say all cats are black, all dogs are beige, and all cats have yellow eyes, all dogs have brown eyes. Cats always have their tongue out, dogs don't. Cats have stubby faces and long whiskers, Dogs have long snouts and short whiskers. So AI learns those rules just by kind of spitballing and seeing what sticks. Deep learning um, tries multiple different images and eventually it throws out the rules that are not consistent and it learns rules that are. And so here we add different things about face geometry, different things about ears. Maybe we learn something about their environment, um, Maybe dogs are sometimes behind fences, cats aren't necessarily. And over time we converge on rules. And this is frankly how people learn through observation, through learning over time, how these systems work and how the world works. The way that it works is that there are these things called threshold logic units, TLUs or perceptrons. They take a lot of evidence as input. They have some sort of summing function and they make a judgment that either activates or deactivates based on what it sees. And we stack together enough of these TLUs or these perceptrons or these digital neurons. And if we have enough, we can approximate any complicated problem. We just need a complicated network. And the last step is this back propagation, right? Which is what I was saying at first, we've got, here's our guess, here's our ground tooth, uh, truth, measure our error, right? And then the learning system over time learns, was that neuron a good neuron or a bad neuron? And do we need to adjust its weight or what it activates on? A lot of you watching this may want to implement some form of AI. Um, it's exciting to want to work with deep learning. I'd encourage you to not look at that as your first guess. Uh, there are a lot of different, easy to implement, non-obvious solutions. And if you think about the problem space and your toolkit, you may find something that works way better, way easier. Robotic automation is another deep technology. 
We know traffic is a big problem, right? We also know accidents are a big problem. So self-driving cars are an example of robotic automation. Um, we can save tons of lives if we can eliminate human irrationality and human unpredictability on the roadway. One thing that I'll point out that a lot of people do discuss in my classes is they talk about autonomous cars. Um, autonomy means to have free will. A car doesn't and probably shouldn't have free will. Right? If you ask your autonomous car to take you to work, it's gonna take you to the beach or to the parking lot to hang out with its friends. What we're really talking about is an automated car. Right? And so we use automation um, in order to handle complex tasks. Again, we don't necessarily need to know all the rules. We can use deep learning to figure out some of these latent expressions, but it's not giving it free will at the end of the day. Right? So where we are with self-driving right now, we primarily have what's called ADAS, Advanced Driving Assistance Systems, but things are evolving very rapidly in this space. There are five levels of automation. There's level zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Um, in the first couple levels, you are driving and the car is helping you. In the last couple levels, the car is driving and you are helping it. So level zero is what most people have today. There's no automation. Level one, you have one automated function. Maybe your steering has a lane keep assist, or maybe you've got adaptive cruise control so that you don't rear end people when they slow down in the fog. Level two does both steering uh, and longitudinal control, so velocity, right, throttle and braking. That frankly is where Tesla is today. They might say that they're level three. Um, there's a lot of debate going on here, but industry has kind of peaked at level two, level three. Cadillac Super Cruise might be a little bit closer to level three. Level three drives itself, but it only in certain circumstances. It knows when to ask for a human handoff. So level one through three is shared control. And it's like riding a horse, right? You can guide that horse, but it's not gonna jump off a cliff. It knows that that is bad for it. Level four drives itself without supervision, but it might say it's rainy, I'm not going out, or I only know the roads in this area, so drive it yourself outside that. And then level five always drives itself. No human handoff, no constraints. Six different sensors we use in self-driving, cameras, LIDAR, sonar, radar, uh, inertial measurement units, and encoders. And AVs have great potential to change the world because frankly, you know, if your car drives you to work and you can work in the car, you could live really far from the office or you could work in the car or you'd no longer need to park. You could reuse that land that we use to park near work because your car could drive home or it could be ride share and other people could use it while you're in the office. In order to support these smarter cars, we will get smarter and smarter, uh, smarter and smarter cities and infrastructure. And these cities become smart because again, we put sensors and actuators and connectivity into them. So I, I'm cognizant of time where I think still okay. I'm gonna power through these last couple sections and make sure we have time for questions. But VR and AR, hugely important for deep tech, basically creating synthetic interactive environments it could be replacing the entire environment in virtual reality. In augmented reality, uh, you would instead superimpose digital images over physical images. These are basically new actuators that let people engage with computer systems and data and analytics. Right? Pokemon Go is a great example of augmented reality. Different types of setups, some of them use cameras outside that aim at the headset and tell you where the headset is. Some headsets use cameras in them and look at the environment, pros and cons of each. But if you're gonna get really into it, be aware of the difference, right? Inside out where you have a camera in the headset tends to be more popular just because you don't need to do anything to the environment to run it. The market is growing very quickly. Um, we're missing the Valve Index here, which is another new one that came out that is very, very good. Uh, and next gen is being developed right now as we speak. We talked about new actuators. There are actuators to support VR, AR, and XR as well. So tactors, treadmills, even things like centimeters for better or for worse. Uh, AR also developing by leaps and bounds right now. And Google Glass for this uh, AR, MR, 
solution is making a resurgence. Uh, I think this might be the second to last new topic that we have. What I, what I want you to know about this, there's a lot of words on the slide, forget about it. Security is really important. If you are building any sort of deep tech solution, think about privacy, think about security, think about users. At the end of the day, too many people don't do that. And it's to the detriment of their users, those companies, and frankly, society writ large, um, that people don't implement security from the start. There are a lot of problems out there with connected systems right now, simply because we're building to budget and we're trying to race so that we get product out the door as quickly as possible. The result is we've got these embedded systems and devices that we can tell to go do something dumb and they do it because they don't think about it. So one of the new areas of deep tech that I've been exploring for a number of years is cognitive models that can anticipate consequences before acting. Um, and so if you think about, you know, reading this pizza box here that says microwave for 200 minutes, you know that that doesn't turn out well. You know what a pizza is, you know what a microwave does, and you know that 200 minutes is a long time. And so you can catch and act on, or rather not act on these negative commands because you have these models in your head. And so one of the areas of deep tech where we're doing a lot of work right now is simulating commands in virtual environments. And if we know that something bad could happen or will happen, then we reject the command, but otherwise we let it pass through. Um, I'm going to skip over this right now just to make sure we touch on blockchain. You've probably heard a lot about blockchain. I know that there were other presenters uh, at Campus Party talking about it. Blockchain fundamentally is a combination of four existing technologies. Um, all of these have been around forever. It's the combination that's unique. But basically, we have a common database. We have cryptography involved to make sure that everything is secure. We have a network that observes what's going on so that other people can validate something did or did not happen. And we have digital contracts in it. And so digital contracts are pretty cool because you can set up contracts that automatically execute without escrow. When conditions are met, money moves from one party to another. A title moves from one party to another in a completely automatic fashion. And uh, this contract is frankly the basis of how things like Bitcoin work because it is exchanging money with other parties in a trusted sort of way, trusted but anonymous. Other areas of exploration, quantum computing. Um, instead of bits, you've just got quantum phenomena that you, uh, that, that you model. So there are four possible states. Um, what's cool about quantum compute is that it can kind of undo a lot of what we've learned in computing over the past 50 plus years. We can solve problems that were impossible to solve before potentially including undoing Bitcoin and blockchain in general. Probabilistic computing rather than ones and zeros, having, uh, having you know, 0.5 probability or 0.6 probability of being a one. What's nice about that is you can use low power, high yield microcontrollers. And so you can make really cheap systems that work well most of the time. Um, and there are huge advantages to this where it's not safety critical, right? but you want to know in a very energy efficient manner or in a very quick time, what the answer might be. And so because of that, we're heading towards potentially the singularity, you know, computational intelligence exceeding that of a human. Um, the singularity is an interesting topic. If, if you're concerned about AI or interested in AI, I urge you to read more about it. Conversational interfaces, big deep technology, Amazon Echoes, Google Homes. Um, we're talking to computers now, and that is a good thing because it's a new way for people to engage with computers. And eventually things like brain interfaces will be coming in the pipeline. Um, this is work a colleague of mine did on using VR to uh, VR and, and brain interfaces so that you could look at things in a menu and without eye tracking, uh, select items on it. It, it actually turns out when you look at something that is flickering, it can be flickering too fast for your eye to resolve, but the brain sympathetically flickers in certain regions. And based on the flashing rate of a part of your brain, you can determine which icon you're looking at because the icon is flashing at the same rate. So that's what deep tech is. Those are some examples. I want to close with a message that deep technology may seem hard to build, but it doesn't have to be. Small teams can do really great work quickly and using commodity tools like the Arduinos, the Raspberry Pis, the sensor kits that I talked about. 
Um, these are a couple example projects of real systems that my students built in five days or fewer. I think all of them cost under $300, but things like digital flood monitoring, portable light switches that are smart and connected, smart video doorbells. Um, these were done a couple of years ago even. And so at the time they, they were far more impressive than they might sound now. We had smart bike helmets that unlock the bike automatically when it's worn. We had doors that unlock when they recognize your face. We had swarm robots to deploy a Wi-Fi, even a smart fridge. So find a problem that you're passionate about and then work will be fun, right? So the last thought that I'll leave you with is while you work towards your headlines, consider becoming a deep tech ambassador. So that means read the latest in innovation across fields, not just one, not just AI, not just mechanical engineering, right? See if you can find synthesis across these areas. Build things, learn things, do things, generate a library. Work as engineering mercenaries, find opportunities to solve problems and solve them. Work with industry and pursue your passion. And if you follow those points, you'll be well on your way to becoming a deep tech practitioner. So in conclusion, deep tech is risky, hard, only recently possible, solves a real problem and is not yet ubiquitous. It's enabled by advances in sensing, computation, networking, energy storage, and AI. Deep tech can solve a range of meaningful problems, right? And done right, the things that make headlines today in deep tech will become boring tomorrow. And the hardest part in deep tech is not building it, even though by definition it's hard. The hardest part is finding a problem that you're passionate to solve and getting the right team together. Um, if any of you are interested in studying deep technology, I'm looking for students and postdocs primarily to work on pervasive connectivity, universal diagnostics, and enhanced self-driving. So look me up, send me an email. Uh, I'd welcome uh, a resume, and if you've got a letter of intent, happy to read that too. So with that, I think we've got about 11 minutes for Q&A. Uh, All right, thanks so much, Josh. Let's see if our YouTube Q&A. Looks like we don't have any questions in the live chat just yet, but. Um, Let's wait a moment and see if we have any come in. Campus Airs, I encourage you, if you have any questions for Josh, to put them in the live chat. Um, but Josh, I'll have a question for you. Um, is, mm -hmm. is there any advice that you can give to, I know you, you kind of did a, a call out for potential students of yours. Do you have any advice for students who are looking to get into deep technology going into college? Yeah, I would just say, get your hands dirty. Now is the best time ever in history to get involved with deep tech, whatever deep tech may be. There are readily available tools for hardware development, for software development, for AI. Um, they're inexpensive or in many cases free, and there's no harm in trying. So find a problem that you're passionate about, uh, find a development kit and tinker. And the library building that you do Sorry, I shouldn't have pulled that window on there. <laughs> the library building that you do really is what will give you the tools you need to succeed later in life. Great, great. Well, it looks like we don't have any questions, but is there any closing remarks that you would like to make? Uh, no, thank you for having me. Really fun to be invited and to participate and uh, looking forward to seeing this event in person next year. Yes, thank you so much, Josh, and thank you to our, our Campus Party USA Digital Edition sponsors as well. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Hello, I'm Robert McGee, Executive Director for the Engineering Society of Detroit, and I'm a proud supporter and sponsor of Campus Party Digital Edition. For 125 years, our society has promoted engineering excellence and innovation. From the rise of the auto industry to the fourth industrial revolution we are experiencing today. Through it all, engineering and technology leaders in Michigan the state that employs more engineers per capita than any other have been at the center of our progress. This summer, you have the opportunity to get a taste of Campus Party virtual digital experience. And next summer, 
the live experience will be held in Detroit in the summer of 2021. Michigan is home to 22 colleges and universities with a better engineering programs. We hope you will join us. The challenging times faced by business these days have shown the difficulty in managing HR issues and maintaining profitability. Keeping focus on the core business and finding the right partners to help with ancillary functions like HR administration is why more than 500 companies across the country turn to Tryon Solutions. Tryon relieves the stress and burden of HR administration so companies small to large can stay focused on why they went into business in the first place. Small companies turn to Tryon to manage their payroll and taxes, benefits administration, workers' compensation, and regulatory compliance so they don't need to build a big HR department. Larger companies add Tryon as an extension of their existing HR staffs, achieving efficiencies and enhancing the bottom line. Check out Tryon at RelyOnTryon.com and receive a free consultation from one of its business advisors. It'll be the best business decision you'll ever make.